Welcome once again to Colorado and me. I'm your host, George Blaze, checking in once again with a guest who you guys just got to get used to. He's going to be a regular here, columnist with the Denver Post and host of a brand new podcast, which you all guys, you got to really, really check out. Ian Silveri. Ian, it's good to see you again. You too, George. Thanks for having me back. How are you doing? Doing well, doing well. Um, let's talk about this new podcast, a new project for you. What's it all about and uh, what's the groundwork here? So it, believe it or not, we've actually been doing this for a little while, 50 episodes so far. It's the Get More Smarter podcast, uh, which you can find at getmoresmarter.com. It's a collaboration between Progress Now Colorado, which is the organization I run, and coloradopolls.com, uh, which is a, a very well-trafficked progressive blog all about politics here in Colorado. So if you haven't already been checking them out, you probably should too. And once a week, we interview elected officials and political operatives and candidates and other folks in the Colorado political space and try and figure out what's going on with them. We play a couple games. Uh, we used to have a game called Duke or Donald, where you have to figure out if it is the former Grand Wizard of the Ku Klux Klan or President Trump. And it was very difficult and depressing. So we recently changed that game to something we call Q Donculus, which is all about the QAnon conspiracy. Uh, my co-host Jason makes up a fake QAnon conspiracy and then reads me a real one. And it's up to me to determine which one is quote unquote real and which one he just made up. And that is also surprisingly difficult. That sounds like uh, uh, one that would be real difficult for me. And uh, since you brought it up, uh, it's funny. It's like within the last month or so, um, people who I know who are not following news or following anything or doing any research in any way have suddenly become aware of this QAnon. And they keep asking me, what is this all about? And when I try to explain it to them, because I've been following it for you know six, seven months now of this whole 4chan, 8chan, um, yeah. just trying to explain where it came from, trying to explain the various points along the way in which it has been debunked and we've kind of figured out who it is. Um, and yet people, it's become almost a religion. Um, what, what are your views on this phenomenon? Well, it's, it's absolutely terrifying. Let's start there. And then secondly, like we all suffer from like a bit of selection bias when we talk about things like this, like, oh my God, my friend's cousin's mother is all obsessed with QAnon. So it must be taking over the world. Ah, uh, we actually did a poll recently. Uh, Progress Now puts out a poll once a quarter with our partners at the polling firm Global Strategies Group, who's one of the best progressive pollsters in the country. Um, you can find that at mountaineerresearch.com. It's called the Rocky Mountaineer. And we asked Colorado voters, have you heard of QAnon? And what is your opinion of it, favorable or unfavorable? Fortunately, less than 50% of Coloradans could even identify what this was, and only 8% had a positive viewpoint on it, and uh, 38% um, said that they had a negative opinion of the QAnon conspiracy. I mean, this is going to sound crazy because it is, but the long and the short of it is that QAnon followers believe that there is a global conspiracy of child sex trafficking that is up to the echelons of the Democratic Party, and Donald Trump is fighting a secret war against them, has thousands of sealed indictments against politicians and 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 donors and all sorts of other people that he will be releasing in advance of the election to round people up and put them in prison. There's a lot of scary stuff when you think about that very idea, AKA the extrajudicial kidnapping of political opponents. The fact that you're labeling an entire political party as something absolutely horrible and offensive and horrendous and dehumanizing your political opponents. Oh, they also believe that people are drinking blood. I'm not joking. That is part of this whole thing. It's, so, it, it's really it's it's really wild, particularly when you you know you take a look at some of the stuff. And I mean, it, it goes into uh, the sealed you know, forty thousand sealed indictments. That at some point, like Barack Obama is going to be in in handcuffs. They're they're holding him at Guantanamo right now. From one yep. I saw, like I how how does such what appears to be a large group of kind of uh, former Tea Partiers, now Trump supporters. Uh, how how do they get wrapped up in this, man? None of it, none of it makes any logical sense. Well, there's a thousand inputs to this thing. You kind of think about QAnon as like the super conspiracy, where if you're like a 9-11 conspiracy theorist or like some kind of anti-Semitic conspiracy theorist or a Hillary Clinton conspiracy theorist, this works with all of those. So no matter how you get into it, this thing will absorb you and say, yes, come join. There's a couple interesting uh, theories and analyses on how people get wrapped into this. One is 
having to do with what's called like the gamification of entertainment and information. And what that means is like QAnon looks like this big conspiracy mystery that you can unravel. There's a mysterious figure who claims to be part of the quote unquote deep state deep inside the federal government who's been dropping clues and breadcrumbs and information and predictions, by the way, none of which ever come true. He says on this date, Hillary Clinton will be rounded up by federal authorities. Doesn't happen. Um, None of these things ever happen, but they always find ways to justify it. And the scariest part is now you have Republicans, including a congressional candidate here in Colorado in the third district, Lauren Boebert, who's running for Congress as a Republican, openly embracing or otherwise hinting and winking and nodding at this conspiracy, saying things like, well, you know, I hope it's true because anything that unites conservatives or Americans is a good thing. It is not a good thing. It is dehumanizing. It is terrifying. It is absolutely not true. And anybody who gets wrapped up in this, people who have gotten wrapped up in this have have committed murders. They've committed violent acts. This is all uh, sort of uh, inherited from the Pizzagate conspiracy theory, where somebody walked into a pizza parlor in Washington, D.C. with a rifle and discovered there actually was no basement where people were being kidnapped and held. So, yeah, it's a thing that's run wild. And I think it has to do with the fact that we're all socially isolated, that people are very confused about what kind of media to trust now, and the fact that it kind of hits a lot of parts of the human brain when it comes to, like, games and mysteries and uncovering quote unquote truths and and all that taken together you throw in some partisanship and it's a pretty dangerous stew well it it appears at face value to also it allows people to kind of disassociate themselves from um the blatant dishonesty and, and manipulation of facts and information coming from uh the president of the united states where he's playing 4d chess so don't listen to what he says <laughs> Uh, just right. trust the plan. But enough about that. If you're into QAnon, good for you. Um, I, I got an old Dungeons and Dragons set for you here that I'll send you on eBay so you can call <laughs> in for that. Let's move on to other things. COVID-19. Um, last time I talked to you, I, I, I didn't know where we would be at this point. But uh, like LL Cool J said once, don't call it a comeback. Nope. But it appears when you look at the sickness map, a lot of these red states that were saying that this was a hoax seem to be on the top end of uh, the rise in case at this point. We had Sturgis happen not too long ago. Um, there's a big controversy over the, some statistics that came out of Sturgis. I wonder if, if, if you followed that at all. Yeah, I mean, you know, unfortunately, Colorado, we're experiencing another wave of the virus infections as well here. And What we know to be true is that social distancing, mask wearing, and adherence to guidelines provided by scientists and public health officials does bend the curve and stop the spread of the virus. Unfortunately, you have more conspiracy theories around COVID-19 that are linked up with the whole QAnon thing too, by the way. Um, There's this whole crazy theory in QAnon about how masks are being put on children in order to make them easier to kidnap, which is totally insane. Um, But that aside, like we had in Colorado... A couple of weeks ago, there was a rally at this place called Bandemir Speedway in uh, Jefferson County, where I live, called the Stop the COVID Chaos Rally, where thousands of people came together without masks, wearing MAGA hats, waving American flags, and saying, we will not comply with public health orders, and we need to reopen everything right away and not worry about the virus. I mean, 200,000 Americans are dead. It is now the fourth largest death event that has ever happened in America behind World War II and the Civil War and the Spanish flu. This is number four in terms of the most people ever killed by something all at once. And it is time that we stop this conspiracy nonsense and take this thing extremely seriously. Like, you know, I have a newborn, I have an autoimmune disease. This is not something that just affects the old and infirm. There are 20 year olds dying, there are children dying, there are teenagers dying. And even if you don't die from the virus, the long term health effects that have been coming as a result of it are still unknown, but are starting to become more stark and real. We're seeing people who have consistent and constant respiratory illnesses. We're seeing people with heart failure. We're seeing people who are have neurological disorders that are linked to COVID-19. So yeah, you're seeing outbreaks in the South and the Midwest in places that were sort of ideologically opposed to any of these um, you know, health measures that were put in place. And I got to tell you, George, it's going to get worse in the winter if we don't get it over, under control now, because one of the key ways the virus spreads is in indoor spaces. It's a lot easier to bend the curve when you can be outside and socially distance and be at a park and put a mask on and stay away from people. It's a lot harder to stop the spread when you have to be inside because the weather's real cold in places like Colorado. 
And it, 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 it would help to have some coherent leadership coming uh, from the federal level, of course. You know, you can yep. blame governors and local municipalities for what they are or are not doing. But if there isn't a coherent message, a uh, consistent message, I'm not even I, I'm not going to sit here and, and judge truth facts or matters, but consistent messaging coming from the federal level as opposed to conveniently choosing whatever words win points the week that the president wants to speak on. Um, uh, this is the biggest problem here. It's, it's, a, it's a leadership problem. I agree. It's a, it's a lack of leadership at the federal level. It's the president feuding openly with his own CDC staff. It's the CDC changing recommendations based on political considerations for the president and Republicans. It's, it's, it's worse than it's ever been. I mean, we are in an information ecosystem right now where I at least hope the viewers of this show take everything we say into consideration and use their critical thinking skills to determine whether or not we're telling the truth. And, you know, I am with the best ability I have and with the most information at my disposal. I'm very concerned about this. I actually, you know, luckily we're pretty good at making vaccines for coronaviruses. Like this isn't like the flu. The flu mutates every year. There are thousands of strains of influenza and occasionally we kind of nail it and get the right one. So get a flu shot this year, especially because if you have COVID and the flu, that's a terrible combination. And you can have both at once. That is absolutely true. This is not an influenza bug. This is not the flu. It's much worse than that. And it's much more pervasive. And it's a lot more transmissible. And the human body's ability to fight it is actually a lot lower than it is with the seasonal common flu. I mean, what we learned from Bob Woodward a week or so ago, I can't even tell anymore. Time is just like, totally weird. Um, it was that the president knew how severe this illness was uh, back in February, and he was downplaying it on purpose, allegedly because he didn't want to cause a panic. We also learned that the Postal Service was planning on sending every American a, a set of masks that they could use. That would have been leadership. That would have been a public health response that would have helped bend the curve here. But because of partisan politics and political considerations, those things weren't done. And here we are with 200,000 dead Americans and millions of cases. It is an unbelievable tragedy. And, and it's interesting, you know, if you want to talk about in a historical perspective, I mean, there's one thing to understand like, oh, okay, well, the president said he didn't want to cause a panic and we have to be sympathetic to that. Well, you know, when I think about back in the 60s with JFK, JFK didn't want to cause a panic uh, to let us know that we were hours away from a nuclear war with Russia with missiles right. in Cuba. Right. That to me is a different set of circumstances than allowing a pandemic to devastate and kill poor people across the country. And because they're poor eaters, uh, it's, it's worth losing a couple of hundred thousand uh, if we can just keep the stock market going. As you know, this disease affects disproportionately people of color, people with lower incomes, people without access to good health care. There was a study out of New York City that showed that people with private insurance versus people who had to use the public medical system had far greater health outcomes, far more positive health outcomes. And this is a virus that will kill you if you're poor and non-white and will let you survive if you are wealthy and white. That is unbelievable. They talked about this during the Ebola crisis as well, where it is an acute disease on top of a systemic problem. So what you have is this illness that's very, very transmissible, and your chances of survival are good if you are wealthy and have access to healthcare, but they're not if you aren't and don't. And what happens is you end up hurting a lot more people who have a much smaller voice and then people who have representation and people who have power aren't as affected by it. So of course they want to get things back to normal, quote unquote. And of course they want to reopen the economy and send kids to school because chances are their health outcomes will be just fine. But people who don't look like them or don't live near them or who aren't like them, well, you know, tough for them. I mean, it's just, it's a horrible thing that we've allowed to happen. I don't know what happened to America where we used to care about each other. I don't know what happened to the country that came together after 9-11 and said, okay, we're going to put all this stuff aside and become one country. That lasted for about a day and the partisanship has just gotten worse. And now that we live in two completely separate information ecosystems from one another, based on what party you are, based on what candidates you support, I, I don't know, George, I'm not feeling great about the way things are going right now. And it's freaking me out pretty bad. Well, I mean, you, you mentioned 9-11, the simple fact that the uh, the president of the United States can't show his face in Manhattan, uh, it just kind of tells you where we're at, where we're at right now. And if no one was disturbed by that idea and, and what happened on 9-11 in terms of just remembering what happened there, it's the saddest thing in the world that we're so divided uh, that yeah. the president can't even show his face in, in Manhattan. 
And one of the saddest parts about it all is like, you know, people accuse me of being divisive all the time because I'm pointing out the hypocrisy of conservatives and Republicans and the fact that like a lot of their policy and political decisions are literally getting people killed right now. I have no other way of being. I'm not going to just like pretend this isn't a problem. I'm not going to let people slide by and say, oh, well, you know, they just have a different political point of view than me. It's all okay. It's not okay. When things are normal and we just have political disagreements and we can work together to get through them, that's one thing. But we're in a situation right now where the fundamental ideas that underpin reality are very different based on what party you're in. And I trust scientists and public health professionals and leaders who are saying that we need to work together to stop the spread of this thing. There are plenty of other countries who are having outbreaks and resurgences of the virus, but a lot of their cases are a lot less bad in terms of outcomes than ours are because they have universal health care or they have access to information or they trust scientists and they're using social distancing and mask wearing and other preventative measures to stop the spread. We're doing much, much worse in terms of overall cases and overall percentage of the population who are dying from those cases. It's not just that we're measuring and testing more and that's giving us higher numbers. It's that the overall health outcomes are worse in America than almost any other country on the planet right now. And we're one of the largest countries on the planet, so we cannot afford for this to continue. We need leadership and we need to stop this thing now, or this is how we're going to be living for decades. And nobody wants to keep going like this. Absolutely not. And there's no way we can keep this going. But like you said, we're entering winter, the, you know, the flu season, which is normally bad here on top of COVID. I don't know what this is going to look like the next couple of months, but um, let's look on the, on the, on the scene moving forward uh, to November here. And I want to push you a little bit on this one. Um, honestly, Ian, uh, when I look at, uh, the Biden-Harris campaign and the Democratic Party in general, and I look at what's going on on the RNC side with Trump, um, there's no enthusiasm on the Democratic side, and I think it's their fault completely. I think they're completely misjudging what we're rolling into here in November, and I think they're going to make the same mistake Hillary made in 2016. That's just my opinion on it. What do you feel about this? So luckily, that's not what we're seeing in the polling as far as Colorado is concerned. And a lot of people like to say, well, the polls were wrong in 2016. They actually weren't. The polls showed very tight races in Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania, which all went the wrong way. They did not show tight races in Arizona and Georgia, where the Clinton campaign decided to spend resources when they definitely shouldn't have. The way to win a presidential election in the United States of America is to get 270 or more electoral college votes. That means that you have to concentrate your resources in the states that have a number of electoral college votes that you can pull together to add up to 270 or more. The Clinton campaign had a very fundamental problem with arithmetic in 2016, and that's why we're where we are today. They also had a candidate that, quite frankly, just wasn't as attractive to people as Trump. We were in a change election. People said, all right, well, let's give this guy a shot. Republicans for years have been talking about business people in office instead of politicians. And I think there's a lot of voters who regret that choice. Where I'll push back on you pretty pretty strongly, though, is on this enthusiasm question. The Rocky Mountaineer, which is the poll that we do every quarter, um, go to mountaineerresearch.com and you can read that. Um, we found that there's actually a seven-point gap in terms of enthusiasm that favors Biden voters in Colorado. We asked one out of 10, how excited are you to vote in this November's election? And then we split it up by if they said they were going to vote for Biden or if they were going to vote for Trump. Overall, on average, 82% of Coloradans say they're 10 out of 10 excited to vote in this election. That's great news. 80% of Trump voters say they're 10 out of 10 excited, and 87% of Biden voters say they're 10 out of 10 excited. So a seven-point enthusiasm gap might not seem like much, but when you tally up something in the neighborhood of two and a half or three million votes, which is probably where we'll get in Colorado, if not more, um, that will make a huge difference in the outcome. And quite frankly, the Biden campaign needs to win in a landslide. Otherwise, the Trump campaign, I mean, let's face it, Donald Trump is going to do everything and anything he can to sow doubt in the outcome of the election unless he is the clear and runaway winner, which he will not be. And he will try to stay in power. And as we've learned from this week's Supreme Court debate, there are plenty of people who are willing to throw out every single thing they've claimed to believe in from 2016 on back in order to maintain power and give Donald Trump as much authority in the government, be it the legislative, judicial, or executive branch as possible. So uh, there's an article in The Atlantic this week that you should read if you haven't already. It's pretty scary. There are a lot of political scientists who study other countries and who study political movements and are looking at the situation we're facing in America right now and have big red flashing lights going off saying, we are headed for a constitutional crisis, a crisis of legitimacy of the very fabric of the country, because each side is not 
ready to accept the results of the election if their side loses. That is a very scary prospect. Oh, and guess what? Russia is back at it again, and they're going to do everything they can to sow doubt, sow doubt and seeds of uncertainty and question the results of the election. They want us fighting with each other. That's how they win and become a superpower again, is if America enters, I mean, God forbid, a civil war, but even just like another level of civil discord. It is really scary out there. And I'm sorry well, to be like such a no, doom and gloom no, guy. No, it's like, not, you're, not, you're not doom and gloom. That's not doom and gloom at all. I mean, this is this is honest, intelligent analysis. And, you know, we, we survived 2000. We survived the hanging chads. Uh, that wasn't, you know, that is as much of a crisis as anything. And we're not, I'm still not sure what the hell happened in Florida in that election, but we made it through, we made it past. We're several administrations past that. It's, it's, it's in the history books at this point. Um, I, I, I honestly think, I don't, I don't think I can stomach sitting there watching Fox and CNN on election night this year. The amount of hyperbole and BS that's going to be flying on both sides. Is, I, I, don't know what I, I don't know if I can stand it. Yeah, I hear you, man. I'm not looking forward to election night. I mean, election night is like the the greatest holiday for political operatives in the history of the country, especially presidential, especially presidential election nights. Like I look forward to this every four years, like it's Christmas, Hanukkah, Kwanzaa, Rosh Hashanah, and all smashed together. Like the greatest holiday in the world. <laughs> not this time around. It is really, really scary out there. Um, I mean, look, like obviously I hope Biden and Harris win in a landslide that the outcome is so decisive that there is absolutely no legitimacy to any kind of claims that this was stolen or rigged or anything that Trump is already saying. And he said this back in 2016 too. Remember, no one expected this guy to win, including him. Oh, I wanted to go back to the polls are wrong thing for a second because the fundamental misunderstanding of what people were looking at in 2016 was that polls are two things. One, a snapshot in time, and two, a statistical instrument that is not perfect because none are. They all have built-in margins of error. They're typically between three and 6%. So even if you show Hillary up six or Biden up six, mm -hmm. there's a chance that that could be completely wrong and Trump could win that state by less than 1%, which is what happened in Michigan, Wisconsin, and, uh, and Pennsylvania in 2016. Also, people like to throw a lot of blame at guys like Nate Silver, who are um, poll aggregators, who look at the sum total of all the st stats and information out there and make predictions. He said Hillary had a 90% chance to win. If you do play Dungeons and Dragons, you know that 10% means one out of 10, which is actually not that bad. People look at 90% as like, that means 100%. It doesn't. It means nine out of 10. So one out of 10 times is not impossible. It's just unlikely and unlikely things happen all the time maybe it's not so much a question of the enthusiasm in the party or in the campaigns but the optics are certainly different um why why uh, why is joe biden have so little tv time well i because he's not the spectacle i mean we learned this in 2016 the media is making the exact same mistake they made last year by giving donald trump trillions, this is not an exaggeration, of dollars in free advertising via the media coverage. And he knows this. This guy is smart at one thing specifically, which is weaponizing the at the the arms and the strength of government and his position and the bully pulpit to gain attention for his campaign and to be able to spread his message with very little pushback. So this is the thing that I'm seeing is like, Everybody wants to watch the spectacle. All cameras are always on the Trump rally because he's going to say something crazy. And every time he says something crazy, people click websites, people go on Twitter, they click links, they follow, ad money comes in. I mean, quite frankly, like one of the things that I'm looking at pretty closely now is like how public media is covering these races. And if you look at like Colorado Public Radio, Rocky Mountain PBS, two amazing networks we have, nothing to, to say nothing of like your fine network. And I, I don't mean to be drawing uh, dispersions or comparisons on anybody. But like, it's interesting to see how commercial media versus public media covers this race. It seems to me it's a lot less spectacular on the public media side because they're not trying to sell ads. They're trying to inform the electorate and, and residents and citizens. So I hope and, and believe that, you know, I think we'll be able to get through this, but this is certainly, I think, the greatest test that the Republic has ever seen, maybe since the Civil War. Well, and certainly if, if they don't come out victorious this time around, uh, as we've seen in Colorado, the legislature there, uh, the party's going to implode and won't be the same again for generations. That's right. Um, that's I think right. That's and 
it's about time. They they need a reckoning. I mean, after the 2012 election, there was a report issued by the RNC that said maybe we should stop trying to regulate women's health because we need women to vote for us. And maybe we should stop trying being so horrible to immigrants and communities of color because they're an emerging part of the electorate. They're Americans, too. And we should make sure that we have an argument to make to those people. Flash forward to 2020. The Republican Party does not even have a platform. This is what I wrote my column <laughs> about for the Denver Post last week. I swear to God, their platform is, I think, this is word for word. We enthusiastically support the president's America first uh, platform and will not be issuing a, an official party platform until 2024. Parties have to stand for something. And you know the old saying, if you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything. Uh, just a couple of minutes left here. I didn't want to let you go without talking about pop culture and media because I'm a media junkie myself. Um, watching the Emmys, watching what they're doing with professional sports right now, I'm bored as hell. Ian, are, are we ever gonna? Are we ever gonna come back to some kind of normal? I don't even know if I care anymore. And I think the less <laughs> I care, the less I worry about whether or not it even comes back. What I will say is if you haven't been watching Nuggets basketball, now is the time to tune in. <laughs> we are crushing it out there. A couple nail biter games in a row, but we finally aced the Lakers and now we're headed further down into the championship route. This is really exciting stuff. Broncos not doing so well this season, but I think hopefully there's some time for them to make up the ground. We're only in week three of the football season, but man, that Nuggets basketball, I think is better entertainment than the Emmys and any football game combined right now. So if you haven't been watching, tune on in. I know we've, uh, as we're recording this show today, we've got this uh, verdict on uh, Brianna Taylor. Uh, the the, uh, the the mayor is making an announcement as to whether or not charges are going to be pressed here. Um, they've locked down many cities across the country. Um, I, I think it's going to be a bumpy weekend. Um, I uh, just take care out there, man. Thank you, my friend. I really appreciate the time. It's good to see you again, and you you and yours stay safe and healthy too. Will do, will do, and make sure we catch you on that podcast there. I'll make sure I put the link here on the screen so you can check out Ian on his podcast as well. We'll see you next week right here on Colorado and Me.